Welcome to Friends and Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, and Patty Callahan Henry are four longtime friends with more than 70 published books between them. Together, they host Friends and Fiction with author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing to highlight and support independent bookstores. They discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Hi, everyone. It is Wednesday night. And that means we are right here with you for Friends and Fiction. We have the most amazing evening ahead of us. I can see all of your comments. I'm so excited for tonight. So let's get it started. I am Patty Callahan Henry. I'm Christy Woodson Harvey. I'm Mary Kay Andrews. I'm Kristen Harmel. And this is Friends and Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors endless stories to support indie bookstores, authors, and librarians. Tonight, we are talking with Emily Giffen and Harlan Coben. And for the Afterwards show, we will be talking with Kate Quinn. I mean, what more could you possibly want in one show in one night? <laughs> I know it's completely jam packed. It's amazing. Okay, but first, we are so grateful for your over the top, amazing response to our new behind the book partnership with our friends at Fable, a free app for your phone or tablet with loads of incredible book clubs to join. If you stick around later in the show, we'll be clearing up a bit about how it works and why it's worth that $5 a month price to read along with us in our premium club. So make sure to stay tuned for that later on. And have you heard that the four of us are all on the road together? This summer, you have two more chances to join us in person at a ticketed event at Bethany Beach Books in Delaware on Wednesday, July 20th, and at a fabulous luncheon on Thursday, July 21st at the Rehoboth Beach Country Club, also in Delaware, hosted by independent bookstore Browse About Books. You can find out more under the featured tab on our Facebook page or by visiting browseaboutbooks.com or bethanybeachbooks.com. Both beach towns are gorgeous, so it's a great excuse to go on a summer vacation if you don't have one booked, but make sure to buy your tickets in advance because um, we hear that these events are selling really well, so we don't want, we want to get a chance to hang out with you, so we hope we'll see you there. And do not forget, as you know, we continue to encourage you to support indie bookstores when and where you can, and one way, we think a great way to do that is to visit our own friendsinfictionbookshop.org page where you can find Emily's books, Harlan's books, and Kate's books, and books by the four of us and our past guests at a discount. So each week, we're going to be giving you a chance to ask us anything. So if you have a question you'd like the four of us to answer or a topic you'd like to discuss, we're all ears. In fact, feel free to drop questions in the comments now and we'll pick them up for future weeks because we want to help answer some of the things you want to hear about. But this week, we're going to do something ever so slightly different because we have a brand new cover to reveal, and you guys are the very first to see it. No, we were like, the very first to see well, it. We, well, I don't know. Maybe she has. I, I've just recently learned Christy has other friends other than us. So <gasps> weird. I know. I know. We're disappointing. So we we may not have actually been the first to see it. And I'm going to go we right into my pillow we after totally after we finish this show. Yeah. So you might have heard that Christie's brand new The Summer of Songbirds releases April 25th of next year. So, uh, Sean, do we have a cover we can show? Can I do a drum roll? Bring it back up. Oh, it's so cool. Yeah, it is. It's perfect. It's perfect. It's yeah. It's really good. It's okay, good. Christy, it's since we good. weren't the first ones to see the cover, right? well, at least you can tell everybody about the new book. <laughs> well, tell the rest of these people about the Summer of Songbirds. First, I would just like to clear up that <laughs> you were the first people to see the cover. I sent it to you guys before I even sent it to my mom. Don't tell her. I know she's watching. Right now. Okay. <laughs> 
I love it. I love it so much. Um, but the Summer of Songbirds is coming out April 25th, like we said. So it's a little while away, but it is about three best friends, Daphne Lanier and Mary Stewart, who met at summer camp, and Daphne's Aunt June, who buys the camp after a tragedy in her life. So after the summer of 2020, the camp is struggling to make ends meet, like a lot of camps were in real life. And these four women um, band together to try to save it. And at the same time, Daphne, who is an attorney, finds out something about her um, best friend Lanier's fiance that is protected by attorney-client privilege. And so she has to decide whether she's going to tell her and potentially get disbarred and lose her job. Um, she's a single mother, so it's a big decision. Or if she's going to let this um, sort of the only person who's always been there for her uh, walk down the aisle, not knowing this big thing about this man that she's about to marry. But Lanier has a secret of her own. And when Daphne uncovers it, it might just change the way that she feels about everything. So I'm oh, so okay. excited. I'm, I'm finishing up the edits on this book right now. I cannot wait to share it with you. And I was just going to say that I actually got the idea for it. Um, uh, my son's summer camp was canceled in 2020, but the camp actually like did this fun um, reboot and we all got to go to family camp instead. And it was so fun. And it was a camp that has been around for like 75 or 80 years. And I just remember thinking if these walls could talk, like the stories oh, that can tell yeah. about generations of women who have been at this camp. And so um, that's really what inspired the story. And I'm just so excited to get to share it with you guys. But ladies, so for our Ask Us Anything this week, um, briefly, I just wanted to know, can you share one of your favorite summer memories? You know, I'm not the right one to start this off because I never went to summer camp. Can you believe it? I, I never what did summer camp. It doesn't have to be a camp memory. Just well, to it, true. So I, I will say that one of the summer memories that sticks in my mind and that I think will always be in my mind is that every summer we went to visit my parent, or my grandparents at their house on Cape Cod. And I can still smell how the house smelled and, and envision walking in and seeing my grandfather standing there cooking his bacon and potatoes at the stove. And it was just such a meaningful time. It, it still is. I still have very warm thoughts about that. I love that. I'm really disappointed you didn't tell us about your memories of band camp, Kristen. Oh, I did go to band camp, but it was not a sleepaway camp. Okay. Next time I'll tell you about this one time at band camp. <laughs> Yeah, um, we had five kids in my family, so there was no money for summer camp. But my mom did send us to day camp um, at the at the elementary school. So my memories revolve around ten cent popsicles, yeah. reading comic books in the school cafeteria to get out of the heat, um, kickball and arts and crafts um, pot holders. Love it. Uh, I totally made arts and crafts pot holders. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wish I had kept them. They're probably, I could sell them vintage on Etsy for like mm -hmm. a million dollars. And our moms had to act like super excited about them. <laughs> I was like, oh, another mm -hmm. pot holder. The most beautiful pot holder I've ever seen. You can always oh, use those. another popsicle frame. It's awesome. <laughs> um, we spent our summers, like Kristen, in uh, Cape Cod. My dad was a preacher, and he would leave for two months every year. They got, like, a reading two months, and we spent it up there. So just thinking about summer makes me think about Cape Cod. It's Same. just That's so fun. I know. No camp for me. If I ever went to camp, it was with the youth group. That's so. still camp, though. That counts. Yeah. So there's one question from Elaine Atwood that I thought we'd quickly address. She said, I would like to know how to find book signing schedules. I was lucky enough to meet Kristen, but I missed MKA. So easy, easy answer for you, Elaine Atwood. The newsletter. Every week we put out a newsletter. It has everyone's appearances and events in it and um, interviews with our guests. So Emily and Harlan are in it this week and all our websites are always up to date. All right. Let's welcome our guests, Emily Giffen and Harlan Coben, two number one New York Times bestsellers in one show. Emily Giffen is a dear friend and the New York Times bestselling author of 11 novels, including Something Borrowed, Something Blue, and Love the One You're With. Uh, Emily's debut novel, Something Borrowed, was hailed as heartbreakingly honest and Vanity Fair would later dub her as a modern day Jane Austen. Her books have been translated into 31 languages and over 12 million copies have been sold worldwide. Initially, additionally, five of her novels have been optioned for the big screen with the first, Something Borrowed, hitting theaters in May 2011 with the all-star cast of Kate Hudson, Jennifer Goodwin, and John Krasinski. I just I watched that movie the other day. 
Yeah. It's like yeah. It's heartbeat. It's like so, so good still. Totally holds yeah. on. <laughs> Absolutely. A native of Chicago, Emily graduated summa cum laude from Wake Forest University and the University of Virginia School of Law. After law school, she moved to Manhattan to practice litigation at a large firm for several years before ultimately retiring from the legal profession and moving to London to pursue her dream of becoming a writer full-time, which I think we can all agree was a decision we support. <laughs> it was a great choice. And then, so, we would have given it a thumbs up. Yes. Exactly. Emily resides in Atlanta with her husband and three children. Her new novel, Meant to Be, which I just finished yesterday and loved, was just published on May 31st. Harlan Coben is the number one New York Times bestselling author of more than 30 novels, including When, The Boy from the Woods, Run Away, Fool Me Once, and Tell No One. His books have been published in 45 languages around the globe with over 75 million books in print worldwide. Well, Harlan is a mystery thriller megastar. He was the first author to win the Edgar Seamus and Anthony Award all at the same time, which wow. is the Triple Crown. And his novels have been called Ingenious by the New York Times and Poignant and Insightful by the L.A. Times. He was the first writer in more than a decade to be invited to write fiction for the New York Times op-ed page. And his Father's Day short story, The Key to My Father, appeared on June 15th, 2003. His essays and columns have appeared in many top publications, including the New York Times, Bloomberg Views, and our, our friends at Parade Magazine. Our friends, yeah. yeah. Harlan is also the creator and executive producer of several Netflix television dramas, including Stay Close, The Stranger, Safe, and The Five. He served as executive producer and showrunner for two French TV miniseries. These bios are so similar to mine. It's just okay. It's like yeah. reading exactly. I'm like, whatever. I know. Same too. Too. <laughs> a native of Newark, New Jersey, Harlan <laughs> still lives in New Jersey, and he lives in the town where I was born. And he lives there with his wife and his four children. Sean, can you bring Emily and Harlan on, please? Hi, y'all. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. Hello, everybody. Hey. Oh, y'all, welcome. We are so excited to have you both. I'm not sure if we can control this, Emily, you're <laughs> I'm not sure if we can control this episode with the two of you, but here goes. Let's try. <laughs> so let's start here. I want you both to tell us what your latest book is about. So we have The Match, which is incredible, non-put-downable, and meant to be. I want you to tell us what it is about, but also I want you to tell us what it is really about. <laughs> and when you Whoa. knew... I know. <laughs> so what it's about and what it was, what it's really about. And maybe when you knew what it was really about, because there's always like that moment. Sometimes it's the next draft or the next or the next. Um, so ladies first, Emily. I think Harlan should go first because his publication date was first. Okay. Yeah. You're in charge. You yeah. go. First. Emily Giffen's meant to be. Is about um, what, what it's really about. What it's really about. Actually, I, I was one of the first people to read Emily's book. He was. Um, he right? was. I read it while I, it was still I, I, in manuscript form. Send it to him when I'm in absolute self-loathing panic mode. <laughs> I uh, will send it to Harlan, and he'll tell me it's not that bad. <laughs> You're That's okay. Great. You can do it. Uh, All is well. He is one of my that. early readers, and I, I appreciate that so much about you, Harlan. Thank you. So anyway, her book is really about. No, go uh, on. Do, do, your, do your book first. Okay, quickly. The, the, I got the idea for the match, which may help explain what it's about. When I was hiking through the woods of Ramapo Mountains here in New Jersey, which I don't like hiking in woods. I find it immensely boring. There's a tree, <laughs> and there's another tree. Again, there's trees. I got... I prefer walking in cities where you're seeing people's faces, bookstores, window shopping, all of that. So I'm ranting to my family the way I'm ranting to you people about you know, bugs and help hating it. And I saw like a five-year-old boy walking on a parallel trail. And I said to myself, what if this boy just came out of the woods and says he remembers no life, but he's lived here his whole, his whole life. He remembers no life but this, no, no parents, no idea how he got there, broke into cabins to raise himself has no idea how he got there. And 30 years pass, and he still, no one still knows how he got there. And then he gets a DNA match, the match, 
And as the book opens, he's standing across the street from his biological father. And that was the sort of the hook and the beginning that became the match. Emily, over to you. Oh, nope. What's it really about? What's it really about? Uh, well, it's really... <laughs> I don't think there's much more. I'm not that deep. You have to understand yes, that. Yes, you are. I'm really it is about not, family. I'm really not Conversing that deep. You know, all the really books are always about are. family, about redemption, about what we try to, to keep hidden, uh, yes. what comes back to haunt us. Um, this is a, It's about friendship. Um, and his partner... Uh, even though he's about 35 to 40 years old, is a 70-year-old woman. And I thought that would be really kind of interesting to explore. That's it. Hey. I'm done with being serious. Over to you. <laughs> How about you, Emily? Well, I will say that Harlan sends me his books too before, you know, in the early stages. And I I, I love this one. And I, yeah. I, I really, I love all of your books, but this one is just, it, it's probably my favorite. Thank you. And um, my edits to Harlan's books typically consist of um, changing up the jewelry of his. Uh, <laughs> no oh, one would. She does say that to me. No one would wear. Aqua no one would wear Harlan. that. Oh my gosh! Like it's like the scrunchie and Sex in the City. Like, well, it's really nice. Like, he, she <laughs> has right. like. Um, it was some kind of turquoise jewelry. Turquoise I have. jewelry. Oh yeah. And like, yeah, that yeah. is so. It's like so specifically. Slash depressing <laughs> on this character. I'm like, no, she's like a high powered yeah. attorney. She's not going to wear like, you know, Arizona gift shop <laughs> sterling and turquoise jewelry. Hilarious. But, uh, I almost is, wore my turquoise tonight. Dang it. <laughs> yeah. well, you know, it just didn't, it didn't work for this yeah. character. So it's, it's really like valuable input, I think. I think. <laughs> It's really the difference probably between him selling, you know, 35 million and 70 million right there. Yeah. And also he sends me, Harlan sends me the covers and the new cover. Can you, have you done your cover reveal on the new? No, new I haven't one? done the cover. Okay. You're the only one who's seen it. Thanks. Okay. It, Harlan is, and what did I tell you? Like, whoa. You, like like, it. you usually yeah, don't. I'm pretty critical of covers. Yeah, but Christy, like I love your cover. Thank I you. love your cover That's and I, I, I love cover reveals and Harlan yours is, this is my favorite of yours so far. Um, cool. Kind of by far. Um, wow. it, was, it was like, I had no suggestions, no color tweaks, no criticisms, no snarky comments. It was perfect. <laughs> okay. Well, it's meant to be. Um, it's a love story set in the nineties. It's um, takes place in New York city in the Hamptons and it follows the unexpected romance between the nation's most eligible bachelor um, from a very connected, powerful, glamorous family and a uh, young woman from a um, very different background and a bit of a troubled past. And so the book explores the question of, um, you know, whether love can conquer all and whether certain relationships are meant to be. Get it? <laughs> Get it. Yeah. So um, and what's, it, what's it really about? Was it really about? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Harlan, you answer that one. <laughs> I'm passing the buck. What's that? I'm passing the buck. To you to, to answer what your book is, is it's, really it's, about. It's the love that's destined to, to happen one way or the other. Yeah. And going through a lot of um, turmoil. And it's certainly based somewhat or inspired by, not based on, inspired by a certain historical yeah. romance that was very important in the, in to, to you, obviously. And to a lot of us in the, was it, I guess, the 90s? Right. Yeah. Um, JFK yeah. Jr. and Carolyn. So um, people, I think, will really kind of enjoy that that aspect also, that you're giving them a little taste of nostalgia for a different era, which is not a bad thing at this stage of the game. So when you hear the 90s, when you hear the 90s, do you think, yeah. of, don't you think it's like two decades ago? Does it seem like three yeah. decades ago? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. No, I think we're all just in denial. But yes, I totally agree. But I guess that's a function of our age, right? Yes. I mean, and and yep. you've got some, you know, some of us are younger than others on here. But I, I, if you're born in 2000, you're not going to be confused about that. When I, was back that in my old, when I was back in my old college, I was kind of like telling the kids a little bit, like the students there, about what it was like. And I realized... Basically, my information is about as relevant as a guy from 1940 
<laughs> telling me about my college experience now. Yeah. yeah. So. Me too. Yeah, it's kind of just it's it's a little disturbing, but yeah. you know the '90s. They they feel I feel like you have to be enough removed from a decade, like yeah. three decades removed, before they become nostalgic. Otherwise, it's just like dated. Um, and then we saw that with the 80s. There's just always like 80s themed parties and 80s this and 80s that. And now I feel like 90s are it, they're having their turn. And it's it feels yeah. a little surprising to to the, those of us who feel like the 90s were like a second ago. Yeah. But um, yeah. and and, yeah. and I've talked about I don't all three of my kids in the 90s, so right. like it doesn't seem. Yeah, right. I you know, actually texted like, Patty and said. I texted Patty and said it like made me realize how important it is when you're writing about something that doesn't seem that long ago to like really set that time period because you're like, wow, like it really was. I mean, yeah. it doesn't sound like a long time ago, but like it kind of was when you're actually like being put back yeah. into that time. Yeah. And I think there's this tendency where, you know, we feel nostalgic about the past. And I've, I've said it, you know, some of my book tour events, like we have to be careful about that. Right. Because it's like, you know, my, when my dad used to talk about, oh, the fifties, everything was great. I was like, dad, you know, uh, Brown versus board of education, 1954. Like, you know, a lot of, there was a lot of upheaval in the nineties. I mean, you, you think about, um, you know, Rodney King and you think about, yeah. uh, Monica Lewinsky, how demonized she was like how, if that story broke now, she would be, you know, the, the me too thing. I mean, yeah. we've made a lot of progress, but for purposes of meant to be in this book, I, I chose to sort of dwell on the, the, the more yeah, golden, rosier, yeah, part of um, about that decade. And yeah, uh, I just, but I think it's, it is important to sort of point out that it wasn't, it wasn't so great for, uh, in a lot of ways. Um, I also feel like what it's, oh, sorry, what it's no, really no, no, no. about me reading it, Emily, is um, about becoming, breaking free of the limitations of, of the family. She had to really break free yeah. of the limitations. I felt like that was a really important. Yeah. Thing. And he of so his. She, mm -hmm. and she had yeah. to come to terms with her place in her own family before she could like love him. Yep. That's what, that was my takeaway. Yeah. Like she had to really like come to terms with you know, her past and who she was before she could like envision a future. I thought that was really Yeah. Cool. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Well, let's tell yeah. you what your book is about. I, is I know. Really yeah, exactly. yeah. You guys, we'll just talk about the book. Yeah. Well, I want to ask you guys a question. Do you have, um, if you were to marry someone who's that famous or to date someone that famous, like, does that, like, this is just my impression. I feel like Christy Woods and Harvey could live up to that. Like, she could just, it would be all fine. They could do a deep dive into Christy Woods, Woods and Harvey and People Magazine and all the tabloids. She'd come up peaches and roses. Yeah, and it would be like, oh, she's, this is a Cinderella. This is like perfect. Not a Cinderella story necessarily, but like this is the perfect story. That doesn't happen, I think, in most families. Yeah. Harlan, yours is a little bit goody two-shoes too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, mostly, I mean, uh, like you wouldn't want to explore Mary Kay Andrews' background because yeah, <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. that would just be trouble, man. Mm -hmm. That would be trouble. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of non disclosures, so I don't think it'll. Come <laughs> I don't that think it'll. Yeah, yeah. I've I've mostly shut down the chatter on it. <laughs> Mine is so scale. boring. Mine is so unbelievably lower middle class, working class, boring. Well, you know, there's a great quote from Flaubert where he said to be regular Flaubert. and normal and bourgeois in your real life so you can be violent and original in your work. Ooh, <laughs> I love it. dropping us with the Flaubert. There we go, Flaubert quote. Look at you, Jersey boy. You you're tossing the Flaubert, Flaubert on the table. <laughs> I got nothing when you're tossing Flaubert around. Oh, my God. Going Flaubert on you. So that's so... been one of my favorites, though. That's, a, that's an awesome, awesome quote. Well, you know, Emily, I have to say, I, I, I finished your book yesterday. Um, I loved it. Finished it sobbing. Um, and it hit home for me, I think, in a really specific way, because the summer that uh, JFK Jr. died, I was actually working on the floor right above him. So I worked for Woman's Day, which was on the 42nd oh, floor, and he worked yeah. for George on the 41st floor. Um, were you like were the 10? No, gosh, no. <laughs> no, I was in my 20s. <laughs> 
but thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so, you know, I spent the first half of that summer thinking of him literally every single day, because every time I get into our shared elevator, um, I'd be wondering if that would be the day that I would see him. So, um, when he, I mean, it sounds like a silly reason to feel so connected to it, but I mean, he had literally been in my thoughts every day. So yeah. when he died, um, it wasn't just that, I don't know, that sense of loss. It was that our building became a shrine to him. So, you know, we would go into work. It was this uh, big building on Broadway and the entire front of the building was covered with flowers, teddy bears, photographs, and literally every single day for the rest of that summer, um, people were crying outside. So it was a very, it was like kind of something, I don't know, that just I experienced again and again. So reading your book um, really just kind of um, reawakened all of that in me. So that was, it was really powerful for me. And um, I thought it was so well done. So what I wanted to ask is, when you're even obliquely writing about real people, it can be daunting to try and imagine the inner workings of their life, their heart, their emotions, you know, all of that that really belongs to them, but that that in order to tell their story right, you know, you have to go there, you have to dive deep. So you tell this tale from both Kate and Joe and alternating viewpoints. And, um, you know, from their parents to their extended family, we know them and then we believe their most intimate moments. I mean, I felt like I was seeing their story unfold. I know it was it's not about them, but it gave me such insight into their story. So after that long um, introduction, um, I was wondering, <laughs> um, how was that for you writing something that was based loosely on someone so well known? And how did you get behind their eyes with such intricate detail? Well, I, I that's incredible that you worked in his building. Yeah, isn't that crazy? I, you have to talk about that offline off yeah. soon. Um, you know, including like how many times did you were you in the elevator with him? I have a lot to ask you about that. <laughs> we'll do that later. You know, um, I grew up fascinated by the Kennedys. Um, my yeah. mother fueled that along with this fascination of the royal family, which is sort of like the Kennedys are America. You know, America's royals. And um, it's sort of the same way, you know, I was thinking about that, like, how do you influence your child in that way? But we see it all the time, you know, with uh, your grandfather teaches you to be a Yankees fan, even if you grow up in Nebraska, you know, it's like, you just like pick up these things. And so I was always interested in them. Fast forward to the mid 90s, like you, I moved to New York City after I graduated from law school, my first, you know, real job, because I went straight from college to law school. And it, you, you were aware, you, everyone was aware that JFK lived and worked there, the junior, yeah. that you you knew he was George Magazine, you knew he'd broken up with Daryl Hannah, you knew he was now dating um, Carolyn Bissett, engaged, then married, and you knew where they hung out, you know, from the tabloid, yeah. which were there was, it wasn't, you know, you, there wasn't social media, but you, you had these tabloids, you knew they were at El Teddy's and the Odeon and certain places, and you would look for them. Now, I didn't work in his building, which... Um, yeah, but fast forward again, July 99, you know, the, the, and I think we all, you know, anyone who was alive at the time and sort of aware of, of his life, you, we all pinned a lot of hopes on him being happy. We wanted him to be yes. we wanted the, the happily ever after to make up for that little boy yeah. saluting his father's casket and his father dying. And so, um, when he, when he died in that plane crash in July, 99, and I was in the Hamptons, I was with friends, I was in the basement. I talk about this in my author's note, so I won't go into that, but, um, you know, just the feeling of, wow, this isn't, this isn't going to, this isn't going to happen. Um, that there, there, that this is like even more, tra this is as tragic as, you know, his, his father's death. It's just like, it was so unbelievable. Um, and so I think, I was I was practicing law. I wasn't a writer. I was I was I was writing. So I should say I was a writer. I just wasn't a published writer. Um, but I was writing um, another novel that was never published. And I think you know, as a writer, we all sort of we we couch a lot of our fiction in this notion of like what if, you know, whether it's like fanciful or rooted in reality. It's like what if? What would that be like? What would it be like to fall in love with your best friend's fiance? Something yeah. borrowed. What would it be like if a kid grew up in the in the woods, you know, with, you know, and then suddenly came into society like you know, Harlan's Harlan's book? Um, there's so I think a lot of that what if and those fueled this piece of fiction. Now, that said, you know, it, it, it really is. It really is, you know, fiction. It's it's yeah. there's 
Joe comes from a very famous family. His father was an astronaut in a time when astronauts were as big as politicians. Um, and, you know, um, but Kate Cooper is very different than Carolyn Bissett, who was, yeah. Kate was, uh, Ka Carolyn Bissett was decidedly middle-class Greenwich, Connecticut, surgeon stepfather, you know, went to college. So once I got into the characters and really started to like develop them, it, it became, it, it was very easy to separate from yeah. JFK Jr. and Carolyn Bissett. And, and, and so from that point on, which was about kind of a third of the way in, I think that's, would you all agree that a, sort of a third of the way in is when we, as yeah. writers, like it starts to feel real. Oh, like we're, we're, you know, it starts to, it starts to feel easier because the, the characters yeah. we created are becoming real. Do you, or you get a brick wall? Yeah. Or, yeah. First yeah. trimester. <laughs> yeah. The trim yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, and so at that point it, it was just about putting little nuggets in of, that the people who are sort of hardcore, you know, Kennedy fans, they, they'll recognize. But if you don't, yeah. if you never followed them or if you were born, you know, after the 90s, it, it won't affect your reading of the book. So it's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I thought it was so well done, Emily. Well, thank you, Kristen. Thank you. And you've all been so kind uh, privately in um, sending me messages along the way. And I just I really appreciate it. I love that about your, your whole, you know, friends in fiction, the support of, of um, writers, all writers, not just women writers, Harlan's here tonight, but it's just really, it's, it's very palpable and you really feel it. And it's, um, it's, it's special what you guys have created. So thank you for having me on for the second time and for being such good, good friends, um, as well as like writerly colleagues. Oh, thanks. Thank you. That's very nice of you to say. We appreciate that very much. I'll answer for all of us because we're the same. We're morphing into one person. <laughs> we're morphing. We are. We yes. are. One sheer um, brain. Yes. All right. So Harlan, yeah. um, we have all, we, we love this title and the double entendre of the title, the match. So we've got the DNA match and the starting of the fire, which is amazing. So did you have to do a lot of DNA match research? And did you dig into any of your own family DNA and history while you were writing this book? First of all, it's kind of interesting that we do have five women and one man. And look at the backgrounds. I look like I'm in a hospital <laughs> video. <laughs> like I'm in a basement in Baghdad or something. <laughs> I did it recently. Did one from a library. And I was thing, like, sitting there. <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna rip on you for that, Harlan, but I, I know, resist. I just, I don't know. I'm sorry about that. Here's you don't have like a fake ones, fake ones on Zoom. I they they send me fake ones to use whenever I do this. So I just sat oh. down late. Anyway, um, <laughs> what was the question? Room Raider one out of ten. Meg is saying. <laughs> I mean, I wanted the match to be a lot of different things. I wanted, I wanted to explore online trolling. I wanted to explore those DNA websites. I wanted to explore those those awful reality um, romance TV shows. And if you like them, that's that's cool. But I just love to explore the how manipulative um, they are. And it was interesting. First of all, I'm the only, I'm one of the few authors who says this. So I don't know if any of you guys agree, but everybody else. And if you're writing historical, of course, it's different. I advise people when they're writing to not do so much research. I think research is a hindrance. Mm -hmm. I, I will defend mm -hmm. that position quickly. First of all, have you ever read that book where the author's just fallen in love with his research? Yep. So he's slowing down oh. the plot because he or she know, loves all this stuff. It doesn't happen with me because I don't know anything. I'm going to need to know basis. So that's, that's first of all. Second of all, research is a lot more fun than writing, isn't it? So <laughs> Oh, I'm going to write this scene on Park Avenue in New York. But first, I have to go God, to I feel so the hot dog stands. You have to watch <laughs> people walk by. No, you know, you've been there. You know it. You can use Google Earth. Write it now and then worry about the exact research later. So with the DNA stuff, I knew just enough to get me in trouble. I did do it. I was so sure I was going to have like this fascinating, cool background. You know, I'm six foot four and I have blue eyes and I'm Jewish and it's 99.8% Ashkenazi Jew. I'm just, all <laughs> there's nothing else in there any place. So I was a little disappointed in that, but I took the actual test. Other than that, I called up 23andMe. I'm always a big fan on how you guys feel. We can open this up because I'm also a little bit on the lazy side. 
I don't like to go through a hundred books to get the information. I will usually call somebody. So if I want to know an FBI agent question, I'll call an FBI agent. If I want to know how DNA works, I'll find someone who works at 23andMe or one of the, them, those places and just call them and ask them. I always think you get that nugget, that little bit yeah. of realism, that one little moment that makes it all come to life rather than a ton of information yeah. that's not going to be very interesting. Mm. I'm yeah, kind I, of a lazy researcher too. I get that. Mm -hmm. I love <laughs> firsthand research because, um, you know, you're talking to someone and if they love what they do in the, in, in the best of circumstances, they'll just drop in some aside right. that yeah. leaves you with your jaw hanging and going, I didn't think of that. And if you yeah. just, you know, d deep dive into dusty books, maybe you won't find that. But if you talk to someone, mm -hmm. they may, you know, and lots of times they do, because I find people love to talk about what they do. Yeah. yeah. They do. Yeah. And Harlan, um, everyone's asking online and we all want to know too, is there a sequel? This is, you know, when I create, I wrote the match, the first book in the call a series is, um, Wild. Oh, boy from the boy from the woods. Mm -hmm. And when I wrote, started the boy from the woods, I realized right away it was going to be at least two book series because it's not his origin story. The match is Batman's parents being murdered story. You know, it's, it's, his, it's his origin. So you can read the match first and then go back and read The Boy From the Woods. I don't know if he'll be back. And to answer the overall question, which I'd be curious about you guys too, I have a series, I have a series character, Myron Bolotar. I have standalones. I have now Wild. I come up with the idea first and I explained how I came up with both The Boy From the Woods and the match. And then when I come up with the idea, I ask who's going to tell that story. And if the answer is Myron, it's a Myron Bolotar. If it's wild, it'll be wild. If it's somebody completely new, which is most of the time, it's someone completely new. I never say, now I'm going to write a Myron. Now I'm going to write a wild. Okay. So whatever oh. the idea is, like the next book is not any of them. It's just another standalone with all new characters. Huh. I do expect that I will write both of them again, maybe even together. I just don't know until I come up with that, that what if. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. That. Awesome. So Emily and Harlan, you have both had the experience of seeing your work on the big or small screen. And I wish you'd talk to us about that experience. Harlan, I know you've been very involved in some of your projects. Does working in a different media change the way you think about writing fiction? It doesn't change at all how I write a book. Um, but but the caveat to that is I am willing and do make enormous changes when I do adaptations. I don't, I, I think the worst adaptations often stay slavishly devoted to the text. Yeah. So, you know, I put them in other countries. I just had one wow. in Poland for Pete's sake, instead of New Jersey, we did Warsaw. So um, I like making changes. I also think it's a visual medium versus a book. So they're very, very different things. Yeah. If you write a book thinking, ooh, this will make a really good movie, you're usually dead. So I just worry, you know, they're very different things you get in somebody's head. So I never think that way when I'm actually writing. Right. I was thinking more in terms of has, has doing adaptations taught you anything like big picture? I don't think so. <laughs> For the most part, you know, it's a bit of a hindrance in terms of writing. Though right. the good okay. thing is because... People are listening to us now, and Emily coined this phrase, so I'm stealing this from Emily, where we've talked about this amongst ourselves, that we are socially adept introverts. Isn't that great? Because we basically, we, we spend most of our time and most of our lives sitting in rooms, mine more depressing yeah. than yours, clearly, <laughs> writing, making stuff up. I mean, that's what we do. Yeah. So I'm very happy here doing that. And then when I'm doing the TV, I will go out and I'll be excited about going on set or talking to the actors or cast. And I do it for like three days. And then I want to run back and be in this room alone. Yeah. So they're kind of feeding off each other in a sort of interesting way. But mm -hmm. our, 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 I'm curious. I'm sure Emily, can, I'd love to hear Emily's answer on this as well. But that's socially adept introvert. I watched all four of you quickly nod at that. Because all of you yeah, are like, yeah, wonderfully we all the full, And I know you guys hang out and you're good friends. But... We all need our alone time, don't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. I don't know. When they're pushing their grocery cart around at Target. I, I'm <laughs> getting <laughs> five. But 
Wait, so why is Emily know. not in the grocery cart at, tar- at Target? Is she yeah. like... Yeah, girls. Why are you in the grocery cart? Around that cart? <laughs> Emily, uh, I'll meet you at the <laughs> Buckhead two-story Target anytime you say. <laughs> but you got to get into that cart yourself. I <laughs> <laughs> I I I do Dollar Tree, for Emily? I'd like to see Dollar Tree. Okay. <laughs> Dollar Tree. <laughs> they ain't... They ain't selling EG at the no Dollar Tree. <laughs> All right, Emily, you're up. Well, I mean, you, you guys, I've done one adaptation. It was 10, 11 years ago. So, I mean, how many have you done, Harlan? Like 10, 8? Some, yeah, someone. Like so, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of, that should be just his question. I thought it was so much fun. I really enjoyed it. I would agree with Harlan that, um, you know, you turn the reins over and I just want it to be true to the tone of the characters. Um, and the, and I, I want my readers not to feel like what this is out of left field, but I don't think they will if, if there's minor plot things being, you know, the lies that bind is actually being um, turned into a, a limited series. I don't, who knows if it'll happen, but I read the pilot and it was fabulous. And she had this plot twist and, cliffhanger at the end of season um the episode one uh, and the end of the pilot that i hadn't written and i thought was fabulous and um you know i'm i'm all for just seeing what a, what a tv writer can do with it now harlan this is a good time to ask you this i've been dry i i've almost sent you this email like three times to you and nicola but we're he's gotten me on board with his producer you, you tell him the situation with all we ever wanted we're trying to make it. I mean, I'm hoping to to make it with my partner who I've worked with on uh, Stay Close, The Stranger, Safe in the Five. We've made four shows together, a woman named Nicholas Schindler and a, and a writer named Danny Brocklehurst. And I thought that would make a really kind of a cool series. So, but as we all know, and all everyone in this room, and it, it's so hard to get things across that finish line. Yeah. Yep. Um, and it's, you know, the other side of it is, as Emily said, it's also really friggin' cool. I mean, yeah. you could be as jaded yeah. as you want. And I'm sure, Emily, you had this experience, too. When you visit the set and you sit there or you meet the actors and you say, I had this silly little idea sitting in this room in the corner. And now yeah. 150 people are bringing it to life. That'll go, in the case of Netflix, it hits 200 million households in, 90, in 190 million countries. The day they snap their fingers and it goes out or whatever, however many. Yeah, so why do people watch so much more TV than they read books, guys? I know, right? right? <laughs> Darn it. Darn it. Uh, There's a lot of people. So it's, it's a, the, it is a cool feeling. I was yeah. on the Zoom with uh, his producing partner and to some of the heads of the studio at, in, in, in England. And what do you think? What do you, what do you girls think I wanted to talk about? <laughs> The royal family, probably. England's the clue, guys. (laughs) I was like, do you think the queen is ill? Like, all I'm I'm like asking them, and and uh, they were so. I wanted to ask you that. Is she okay? I, 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 I don't think. I don't don't think. I think she's really sick. I think she is. But, um, you know, she's she's amazing. But they they were. I think they thought like this is the most bizarre work zoom like <laughs> development because hadn't my producing was, partner hadn't nicola just gotten the obe or something like that from the queen like right before we well, she had tell them about that yeah she got the she got the obe why do i know? i don't even know what it is but she got something <laughs> from the from the queen what where, is and the so obe i don't know what that is on every moment the british empire the everyone queen. knows that patty Maybe. everyone was like, like, was like or, i know but i want everybody else out there to know that but night, 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 night it was prince charles Yes, who gave it Prince to her. Charles did it. So, and I'm like, how are you not just freaking like, oh my gosh. And she was sort of blase about it. As she was freaking out for a while. That was a couple yeah. weeks ago. She, she was, yeah. But yeah. Um, she was, maybe she was just being modest. But um, yeah, after living there for a few years, I was writing something borrowed when I was living there. I, I quickly discovered that Americans can be a little more, I mean, they love their royal, they love their monarchy, you know, that the monarchy, the crown, they support it overwhelmingly, but we take it to a whole new level. We, we, the collective we, we. some of us take it to another level. <laughs> My other observation, by the way, about this is, I don't know if it's the camera angle, but all of your wine glasses look like super huge, like they're like a party <laughs> flavor kind of thing. 
That is not that is not an illusion. Well, that is true. Say, Christy, yours is looking me. Uh -huh. Mine's Why the size is... of my head. And MKA, yeah, yours is pretty full of a couple of minutes. No, I know. I've been, there you know, go. I was, uh, what can I say? You gotta do what you gotta do. I didn't That's drink right. for a week when I had COVID, so I'm trying to, you know, my my Wait. blood alcohol level dropped dangerously uh, low. <laughs> Very starting right. shaming you. Tell everyone when, when we run it, ran into each other on the airport. That was awesome. I'm like leaving for my tour and I pull up in the car and it's the middle of a Memorial Day weekend. So no one's, or no one's really flying on Sunday. And the only person I see is, is Kath, Mary Kay and her husband, Tom. And I'm freaking out, like trying to put the window down, like Mary McKethy, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? What fell out of the car when I opened the door? Oh, her um, Queen Elizabeth doll dropped out. <laughs> Which her, driver's so trying, her driver's trying to <laughs> juggle all her stuff, and all she really cares about is the doll. And my <laughs> husband's trying to check our bags. We're going to New York for the COVID trip, which is a whole different thing. <laughs> and she goes, hey, Kathy. And I'm like, oh, my God, it's Emily. She's going off on book tour. <laughs> I and she looks even at early in the morning. She looks glam, and I look like something. No, no, no. You know. you know what? That's not true. Okay, and you did know. have on like a white T-shirt. I will say that. No, no, that's not true. And the reason that I didn't post the picture because I otherwise it would be good content. It was because I looked decidedly so hideous. And you know what? In the spirit, <laughs> of, in the spirit of being right and proving myself right, I'm going to post that tonight. All right. Well, okay. Because <laughs> I looked terrible, but. Queen Elizabeth suddenly became a second tier citizen to you because I dropped her in the street, like in the in the street to embrace you. I did not pick her up until I had said, you know, my proper goodbye to uh, I Elizabeth. kind of I kind of am wondering how many people would would be granted that privilege with That's the queen true. on the street. I'm just I mean, I it's it's a small number. It's a small go. <laughs> people on this but patty, but patty had it been you i probably would have missed my flight because i would have talked to you she's like clutching clutching her queen elizabeth support doll to her, <laughs> to her breast like i have to go through all i could think about was how are you going to go through security clutching well, that doll well, I, I took her through i certainly didn't check her as you'll note but i'll say i'll say this what a cruel joke that my publisher pay played on me i've been planning to go to the platinum jubilee i was at the last one i was planning on going to that and they have my book come out on the on the same week like are you wow. kidding me okay wow. I know. The direction that that is, we, gotta get, we gotta get this train back on track yeah, okay. I'm okay. Supposed to ask so you. we ran out of time for live questions but, but y'all no so many good ones so if you have a chance so many questions about sequels and about your books and how much they love your books. And so if you get time to go to the Facebook page and look at some of the questions, but what we will not skip because it's everybody's favorite thing is we would love a good writing tip from both of you. So Emily, you want to go first? Uh, my writing tip is have a friend who holds you accountable. And Harlan is that person for me. We will, um, when we get into writing slumps, we have like word count things like we'll go and we'll tell each other what our word count is to just get the words down. It's a little depressing because his word count is always like super high, but like I adjust it for myself and the fact that he's one book a year and I'm one book every two years. But I think it's really important to remember, just get the words down and don't be a perfectionist um, and just, just write, just write, get your words down, get your story out and have someone who holds you accountable to that. Yeah. Actually, mine's fairly similar. I was thinking, um, give, your, give yourself permission to suck. Um, like first that. drafts are supposed to suck. Uh, only bad writers think they're good. We all think we suck. We all have imposter syndrome. I don't care how many books you write. Stephen King has it. Um, he's expressed it to me. So um, my, the saying that I always say is, you can always fix bad pages. You can't fix no pages. Yeah. So get it down. You're going to fix them anyway. I, I look at it like diamond mining, right? So the first thing you take out of the ground is this really ugly rock that, and but that's where all the value is, right? And then the next drafts, you shine it, you cut it up, and you make it into something somebody wants to wear. Get that ugly rock out of the ground. Don't mm. turn up the voice. 
in your head that causes paralysis and says that you suck? Because we all have it. The difference is some of us we are able to fight through it. Oh, God, also, I need to heavily. hear that. That's the other thing. Drink, drink heavily. There's my other people. <laughs> 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 But no, I'm kidding. Who, who, said, who said right drunk edit sober? It's was that Faulkner? Hemingway? Hemingway? Hemingway, I think. One of those Hemingway. old white guys. Yeah. <laughs> no offense, Harlan. Yeah. No offense, Harlan. Bacon. <laughs> okay. Both of you, could you stick around just a couple more minutes? We have a couple quick announcements, and then we have another question for y'all. So. Sure. All right, so I'm going to get through this as quickly as I can. We wanted to tell you a little bit about Fable. But as we mentioned earlier in the show, there have been a lot of questions on the page about exactly what our premium club on the new Fable app is and how it works. So in other words, what makes it worth $5 a month to join? So here is the brief answer, as brief as I am capable of being. So first, I want to say, <laughs> you know me. So I want to say that everything we do on this show is free for you. But our friends and fiction behind the book club um, is something completely different. So Fable is an opportunity to actually read side by side with us. So each month, uh, one of the four of us leads the discussion about the book we've chosen, and we put together lots of discussion questions and behind the scenes info, along with our own thoughts. So you can go at your own pace and check in with the app as you go to get insights for the part of the book you're reading. So for example, right now we're reading Mary Kay's The Homewreckers. And just to give you an example, if you reach chapter 12, you can click on the milestone for chapter 12 within that milestone section. Mary Kay herself tells you all about kind of these hidden secrets behind the scenes. And then she asks a question which allows you to interact and then comes back and comments on your comments and so on and so forth. So it's this nice back and forth with the host author and with each other. We pick a book each month. We're starting next month with books not written by us. Christy will be hosting. She'll be asking the questions. She'll be leading the discussion. It's just a really cool way to read as a community at a pace that's comfortable for you. And we will always be picking a book that we feature on the show, which I think is really important. So we'll be doing deep dives into the books we've already talked about here. So to clear up another question, you do not have to buy the book within the app. You can read whatever copy you have on your own, you know, from Kindle, from your independent bookstore, from the library, however you get your books. It's just $5 a month and you can find out more at fable.co backslash friends and fiction. Phew! I got that out. Good job! Good job. Good job. <laughs> is this when I talk about the Writer's Block podcast? It is. Yeah. We're up. Okay. Good. Um, you know about our Writers Cast podcast. They're different interviews than the show, and we'll always post links under announcements each time a new one drops on Friday. On the last episode, Ron and Patty talked about the novel Darling Girl, which is retelling of Peter Pan by Liz Mikowski. This week, Ron and Meg will talk to Michael Ian Black about Council of Dads. Michael Ian Black, Council of Dads, about his book, A Better Man, for the Father's Day episode. They had so much fun, and I, for one, can't wait to listen. Yes. Okay, guys. I know this is a lot of announcements, but this is a brand new one. So if you're, like, kind of zoned <laughs> out, this is a good time to come back in. Um, we are so excited because we actually have not done this, I think, since we started the show in 2020. But we have teamed up with Booktown to offer, for the first time in a couple of years, the Friends and Fiction First Edition book subscription for 2023. And the thing that makes it special is we all four have a book in it, which is really great. So um, this is a special edition Friends and Fiction subscription box, and it includes new and signed hardcover releases for 2023 from all of us. So that includes my The Summer of Songbirds, which um, we just saw the cover for in April, Patty's um, The Secret Book of Flora Leah, Kristen's The Paris Daughter, and Mary Kay's Super secret holiday project in September that um, we, we're we not going to tell you the title for yet. Because because I don't know it. <laughs> I have my opinions, just in case you want to talk about yes. it later. Okay. You will also receive a really fun gift that you can only get in the subscription box with the first box, which we'll tell you about in a couple of weeks. So it's four different boxes. And the $125 subscription price includes shipping and tax. So it's about 20% off of the cover price of the book. So yay. So um, if you want to check that out, Go to Booktown and um, look for our 2023 First Edition Club. And just one more reminder, our Friends in Fiction official book club is a separate Facebook group that is run by Lisa Harrison and Brenda Gardner. 
um, and features an author chat each month in an hour um, Facebook Live. And this month, they are hosting MKA on Monday at 7 p.m. to do a deep dive into the home records. All right. All right. Before we talk to Emily and Harlan again, don't forget we have the amazing Kate Quinn on the Afterwards show. Yes, we named our after show and it is called After Words. Get it? <laughs> anyway, thanks to MKA who always comes up with the catchy titles. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Harlan and Emily, writer friendships, they keep us going. They really do. And I know that you guys have an incredibly supportive friendship. So, um, Emily, can you tell us how you and Harlan met and how does your friendship influence your work? Yeah, what's your origin story? Yeah. <laughs> Our origin story, uh, we met on the uh, Today Show Green Room. We were both uh, recommending wow. books. And we, um, you know, just, uh, we had followed, we'd read each other's work prior to that. And we just uh, became friends after that. I don't, I don't think that, that I influence Harlan's work. And I don't think he influences mine. But I think it, it, in the sense that you need friends to support you and and get you to the finish line he's yeah. he's one of those people for me for sure yeah. and, Harlan, oh, and so are you patty a, it's a rope just pull. <laughs> um so harlan i'm wondering how your writer friendships in general influence your writing and if there was anything specific about this book that you felt like one of your writer friendships kind of influenced harlan has like three friends i have no friends yeah. Just oh, that hurts my feelings. Just Emily. Okay, wait, wait. But the, when I was on Good Morning America, you had George come in. Who I, I did, didn't I? I did you a solid there, didn't I? You did me such a solid because I just adore him and I always have. And he came in and he's like, oh, we're both friends with Harlan. And I'm like, yeah, we're two of his three friends. <laughs> <laughs> and then, been he, the said, and then he said, then he said, Harlan knows a lot of people. And I said, yes, Harlan does know a lot of people. <laughs> but he has three friends, and we're two of them. And Michael I'm J. Getting, Fox boy, is really getting three. raked over the calls. Those here. are three really say, good friends, kind of, though. Yeah. 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 George Stephanopoulos, Emily Giffen, and a person will be named later. I Michael J. Okay. Fox. He's going to be one of us. But just <laughs> yeah. But, yeah I, you know what? First of all, it's such a, it was, it was fun to, we, uh, Emily and I had such a good time on the Today Show. And I, Patty knows that Patty, for those who don't know, I recommended on one of those appearances I do in a Today Show, Patty Callahan Henry. So, awesome. And you did Mary Kay, too. And I was so honored. We've done them all. Yeah, yeah so yeah. I, that's right. So I've done like two yeah. out of four. So yeah. I, it's actually one of my great uh, joys doing that, you know, being able to. It's one of your great awesome. joys to call me and say, who do I recommend? That's right. Emily, <laughs> what do I do next? <laughs> Patty, Patty, Patty. Let's say, um, Emily and Emily was as a young child sitting on my father's lap. He read me the words of Emily Giffen. <laughs> so I think that was a, a big influence on me. You know, as a as a young child bouncing on my Why father's lap. Why long did you do that on Friends and Fiction? We can Absolutely. do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, if yeah. if Karen Slaughter can drop the f bomb, you can you can flip. She did. Oh, oh, I love how I love how MKA says that though. Is like the yeah, right. Um, MKA is kind of like stuff. steel magnolia. She can kind of say anything, and it just kind of just goes. <laughs> I know the thing she says. She goes over. Said them, forget yeah. it, Harlan. No, no, no. We would be like so it'd be in trouble. It's so unfair. It's so unfair. okay. Kate Quinn's about to come on, and she okay. she wrote in our chat. The writer friends are those whose job it is to beat the content out of you with the great <laughs> content whacking stick. That's right. I love that. Okay, you two, thank you so much Thanks, for joining nice. us. Thank you you are such an inspiration, yes. and I'm so proud of your books, and y'all are awesome. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Oh, Cheers. Nice. Good to love see you guys. Girl. Thank you. Thanks for bye coming. Bye. Okay, everyone, you realized you missed a lot of our 100-plus shows. Well, you can find all of our back episodes on YouTube. We are live there every week, just like Facebook. And if you subscribe, you won't miss a thing. Be sure to come back next week, same time, same place, as we welcome Julie Clark with her newest, The Lies I Tell, and Erica Ferenczyk with Girl in Ice. And my little sister, my actual real-life sister, Karen Cleveland, will be here talking about The New Neighbor, um, which is her upcoming novel in the after show. Uh, and we will have special guest hosts, and I'm not telling you who, so you're just going to have to be here to find out. 
Yay. Oh, and make sure to stay for the ups. Oh, can't even talk. Stay for the afterwards show tonight with our friend Kate Quinn. Good night, Stay y'all. Soon. Thank you for tuning in. You can join us every week on Facebook or YouTube, where our live show airs on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Also, subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram. We're so glad you're here. Okay, so that was amazing. Yeah. It could have gone on for hours. Yeah. I wanted to do like another hour. We had so much to talk about. Yeah, they're so much fun. They are. Okay, everyone, welcome to the Afterwards show. Oh, my goodness. I feel like I, I wanted to take notes, but I didn't want to look away either. It was, um, both their books are so interesting. So They are. They're such good writers. I know. Yeah. All it's right. Funny. Let's welcome our friend, Kate Quinn. I know she needs no introduction, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about her anyway. Kate Quinn is the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of historical fiction like The Alice Network, which was chosen as a Reese Witherspoon pick, The Huntress, The Rose Code, and now The Diamond Eye. A native of Southern California, she attended Boston University, where she earned a bachelor's and master's degree in classical voice. She's written four novels in the Empress of Rome saga and two books in the Italian on the Italian Renaissance before turning to the 20th century. Kate and her husband now live in Seattle, but call San Diego home with three rescue dogs. And we are so thrilled she's joining us tonight. Her books are some of the most talked about on our page. Sean, can you bring in Kate? Hey, Hi. she is. Hi. Hey, yeah. ladies. So lovely to be here with you guys. You always oh. crack me up, and I've been cracking up in the green room back, you know, back <laughs> virtually for the last 20 minutes. Oh. Did you eat the M&Ms we left you? And the champagne? Absolutely. The Absolutely. <laughs> the virtual green room. Welcome, my friend. It is so good to see you again. I want to kind of reach in and give you a hug. Yes. So virtual hugs. Virtual hugs. Do you remember that great question you asked me when we were in Naples, Florida together? So I'm turning the tables on you. I want you to tell everyone out there what the diamond eye is about and then what the diamond eye is really about. Yes, this was a fun, uh, fun question. I ended up asking Patty on the in a hotel room in Naples where we were at an event, and it came out of Twitter, as so many good things do, and mm-hmm. where someone said, "You know, what's your book about? But what is it really about?" And so I thought that was a great way to really get to the heart of what any book really is. And so I can say for the Diamond Die, you know, yes, it is a World War II story about the single mom and quiet librarian uh, who became. Uh, the most successful female sniper in recorded history. That's what it's about. Um, What it's really about though, I think you can say safely, it is about how women embrace and swallow an ungodly amount of rage and an equally ungodly (laughs) amount of perfectionism to Mm. embrace uh, to embrace professional success at a dazzling level while also crippling themselves uh, in terms of mental health and emotional and emotion because they're just trying to juggle too much. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I almost feel like you have to repeat that. That was just amazing. That was really well said. Maybe you could just uh, needlepoint that on something. (laughs) That wouldn't take a while. No, not at all. I always think like, you know, something rude, but beautifully rude that's needle pointed. You go for Alice Roosevelt, who, you know, had the famous needle pointed cushion that said, if you don't have anything nice to say about anybody, then come sit right here by me. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. I love it. I love well, it. hey, we all talk about not only how engrossing historical fiction is to read, but also in your historical fiction in particular, but also how sometimes we write something without realizing how relevant it will be to the time that we're living mm-hmm. in. Um, so as with the diamond eye, this woman sniper, Mila, is a very real woman in history, in history, and she's Ukrainian. So talk to us about this, about how her life and how it felt when the war broke out and now people can find Ukraine on the map. I mean, we all know about it. So what was that like for you? Well, uh, when I was first uh, trying to tell people about this book, I kept hearing things like, you know, Kiev, where's that? Is that in Russia? And I'm like, no, no, it is not. Okay. But everybody at least now knows Kiev is not in Russia, which is a really, yes. Yes. 
us here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I did not an anticipate this book was going to be quite as um, topical as it turned out to be, sure. uh, which I definitely viewed with a certain amount of dismay and also a certain amount of horror just because it's yeah. terrible to see if you've been yeah. studying the ways in which Ukraine has gone through the mm -hmm. ringer, historically speaking, and then to see it play out again in the yeah. news. But I have, in a way, also been, you know, tremendously, you know, pr I, I can't say proud because I'm not Ukrainian. This is not my history. But I am I do feel proud in a way because mm -hmm. it has not surprised me one bit, you know, that I have been researching and reading about and writing about the legendary toughness and courage of and patriotism <laughs> of the Ukrainian people and especially Ukrainian women. And then reading the how that tradition is still being carried on by modern day Ukrainian and Ukrainian women. That has not surprised me at all. And I have, you know, I have, part of it is, you know, part of me has just enjoyed seeing that the world now gets to appreciate that extraordinary bravery. And, you know, history does even repeat itself. I mean, <clears throat> not long ago, I was reading a modern day you know, CNN article about a Ukrainian woman sniper. They did not have her full face, only her eyes, which were very fierce. And they did not have her name, only her call sign or her, her, her military nickname, which was charcoal. Oh, slow burning and very fierce as well. And I looked at this picture of this incredibly fierce eyed young woman with her bundled up sniper rifle who is fighting right now on the front lines. And I thought oh, somewhere yeah. Mila Pavlichenko is nodding in approval. Yeah. Oh, that's so true. You know, Kate, I think that those of us writing about World War II, just because of the number of books that have come out in that sort of subgenre have to work extra hard to find stories that feel completely fresh. And with the Diamond Eye, I mean, you have absolutely done that. In fact, it seems like throughout your historical fiction career, you've always been um, just a step ahead of the curve. I mean, you're finding these stories that feel unique and fresh. Can you talk a little bit about how you find these stories that somehow both appeal so broadly, but at the same time, don't feel at the time like an obvious choice. I, I mean, because um, truly you never seem to have a miss. You just have that absolute perfect combination, I think. Oh, well, thank you. I, I do tend to think, you know, it is such a crowded genre now and yeah. um, it is a very crowded field. And, you know, this is just, and I want to say for anybody who's a new writer, who's, you know, thinking, you know, what you're, what you want to write and maybe hearing that you can't sell it right now because it's not World War II. 15 years ago, you couldn't sell a World yeah. War II book to yeah. save your life. So yeah. that just shows you the way trends come and go. But right now it is a very crowded field. And yeah. what I tend to look for is something that I have not seen a million books about, something that is a little bit, you know, obscure, at least to me, and something that has something fresh to offer, whether it's a different part of the arena. You know, uh, I hadn't read too much that was about the Eastern Front. And so that was, you know, an area I felt that I could explore without sort of stepping on anybody else's dress uh, too much <laughs> in the modern, in the, the field of modern war fiction. Yeah. Or sometimes it is, you know, a person that, you know, who's might, whose name might be a little bit lost to history. So I look for overall, though, that tr I try to find those women in history who have done something truly astounding and brave. Yeah. And yeah. the ones who's, you know, whose feats and exploits leave my jaw on the floor. And that's yeah. the first thing I look for before I even look for a specific era or a specific country or a specific time or place is I want yeah. to find the woman before I find anything else. Cause once I found her or, you know, sometimes it's, it's one woman, sometimes it's a group of women. Yeah. Once I found them, that's when I have my hook. Yeah. Oh, that absolutely that. makes sense. Yeah. I love how you sort of claw out this place in historic fiction for women because there wasn't, and, and these are not passive women who were like rolling bandages and <laughs> fixing, you know, lunches. These women are on the front. They're doing stuff. Yeah. And I think um, that's what makes your books so compelling. I, I can tell you, Kate, I was listening to the audio book of um, um, the Alice Network. And I had to pull off, I was on book tour, I think. I had to pull off the road because my heart was in my throat. That's, I'm really glad you did because I do not want to have as part of my, you know, my bio <laughs> intro for this kind of thing, the, you know, the author who crashed Mary Kay Andrews. <laughs> that would, no, absolutely not. <laughs> 
I just think you have such a gift for, for, and I think of it as clawing out that yep. place in, in, in the um, genre. Yeah. This space that belongs to your incredibly um, brave, crazy, fierce, fierce, uh, fierce, yeah. fierce mm -hmm. characters. But I'm not supposed to be asking you that. I do have a question. <laughs> Um, you know, I followed you on social media and, um, I know I, and I love the overseas gladiator post uh -huh. yeah, we all do. <laughs> and the dog, you have like a three-legged dog. Isn't that right? I do. And, uh, he's curled up very cutely on the beanbag chair that my mother-in-law got for uh, my husband, uh, for, for his birthday. And the dogs immediately said, thank you so much. We love it. You're never going to ever have a chance to sit in it. <laughs> okay. So I follow you besides the overseas gladiator and the three legged dog. I know that you wrote a lot during lockdown. Now, are, were you a member of that crazy 5am club or no? <laughs> <laughs> I have yeah. occasionally dipped my toe in those waters when I have been truly desperate on deadline. But in general, I am the kind of person, if I see Dawn, I'm seeing it from the other side. <laughs> because I stayed up all night. I am not a natural morning person. And um, I really tend to believe, you know, very firmly that in order for, you know, an hour like 4 a.m., 5 a.m. Mm -hmm. to be seen by me. There had better, or really by anybody. I mean, there have, it, it's like a, a, a plane or a book deadline just doesn't yep. cut it. There need to be like serious and memorable, you know, levels of debauchery yeah. involved, hopefully with yeah. like Tom Hiddleston and a trapeze. <laughs> you know, just no, <laughs> a daily road trip will not do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, tell me how you do the research about on these these books are pretty far flung so how especially during lockdown how do you do that research uh well for any book i try to do as much as i can uh, i try to do as much as i can that is you know feels hands-on and has the has as much of the original source documents as i can for the diamond die i was very lucky my heroine in her later years wrote a memoir and oh. she her memoir is very very specific about her war experiences and you know the details about the weapons she used you know the flora and fauna of you know the environments she was in flora and fauna is our bane isn't it anybody else yeah. done those things about like x what, what and, kind of bird is and, native to this area and what is it nesting yes. yet? That kind of thing. Yeah. So she's very specific about that stuff, which was great. And this was her real words. So that was that really was great for, for me as a source. Since this was my 2020 book, though, I couldn't travel anywhere. And that meant, you know, everything had to be clean, gleaned from online, from war diaries, from her memoir, from old yeah. maps, vintage photographs, really anything I could manage to make get that done, which meant that there was a certain climactic scene, no spoilers for those watching, there's a climactic scene where there's a sort of a duel that's being fought in a Washington, D.C. park, and I could not go to visit that park because, you yeah. know, it's late 2020, nobody's vaccinated yet, nobody is yeah. flying anywhere. So there I am plotting a sniper duel on Google Earth, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. which I would not want to do again. And, you know, you know, like I'm sitting there trying to get this done with, you know, my climactic chapter done with, you know, like Google Earth and a guidebook, part yeah. and a park guidebook. And, you know, it's like, you know, you know how we all get mad at those, you know, cook those food blogs where they give you their life story before they give you the recipe. Yes. You know, I was sitting there like snarling my way through this guide <laughs> about, you know, the national parks of Washington, D.C., just saying, will you please stop telling me about how, like, you got over your midlife crisis and, <laughs> your, oh, and your, your midlife divorce with your intense spiritual connection to Rock Creek and Rock Creek Park. And will you please just tell me if the creek's deep enough to sink a body in? And uh, yeah, that's <laughs> That chapter is the body sinking yeah. part. Which is that's, that's <laughs> typical guidebook fair, I think. <laughs> they don't tell you that yeah. in the great, you know, the guidebook, you know, to the <laughs> great na national parks of Washington, D.C. They do not include this in It's a real oversight. <laughs> so weird. So strange. <laughs> you know, I have one more question I'm not also not supposed to ask, but I don't you care. You can ask anything you want. Oh, my God. Whatever you want. It's our show. Um, so your husband's in the military, am I correct? 
Yes, he's active duty Navy. Okay, so does that play any part in your interest in fiction? Like, does he ever say, no, no, honey, that would never happen? Oh, sure. Like, he reads all my stuff and will, you know, sometimes, like, tell me, you know. Yeah, I think you could tune the reaction that way a little bit. And um, one of the things that I, I think it has definitely inspired in me, and he's hovering on the other side of here, wondering if he can poke his head in. Yes! Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, gosh, yeah. we love yeah. the gladiator. We like this all the gladiator. The Hello. Oh, oh hi! You. So, I do think it has um so fun you know, to meet you. The uh I know. <laughs> yes. is, I do think, you know, having you know been a military wife now for a long time, it's I it has launched in me, and maybe I had it anyway, uh an interest in, you know, essentially sort of like the warrior type, you know, the sort of person who mm. You know, how do you deal with, you know, combat? How do you deal with the aftermath of combat? How do you deal with the ordinary hazards of military life? And the thing that I find interesting about it is that it doesn't really matter if it is, you know, first century Rome and you're talking about the legions or whether you are talking about World War II and, you know, the Red Army. Yes, there are a lot of differences, obviously, but there are some things that are universal to the military yeah. experience, okay. like the fact that there is combat stress, the yeah. fact that, you know, that there is, um, you know, the friendships between military oh, yeah. personnel. You form bonds between people. Like, the, I will say, like, legitimately, the bonds that you form in the, in the military very often are, in a lot of ways, much deeper and stronger and I'll, than you'll have between, between two houses um, yes. because you face certain things together that for frankly unless you've actually been there and done that it's virtually impossible to actually explain yeah. what it's like to like be in a position under fire or to like help somebody else try to save s s someone's life or to take a life and i mean i've done all the above yeah. and wow. um it is one of those things that truth be told you, you you never really know how to explain it and and that <laughs> small group of people who have done it um you know they're like the bonds that you form will legitimately last forever i mean like i, I have people that i'm still best for, for friends with um you know 16 years after i have met them and we only served together for two months um, wow, but it's amazing. But it's what you do in that time that yeah. kind of defines yeah. the basis of that relationship. Yeah. Um, so, um, so for a lot of of the military aspects of what uh, of what Kate writes about, I do tend to to kind of like read through and be like, no, we really wouldn't say this. This isn't really like how. Oh my so God, lucky Kate. <laughs> I'm an in-house expert. I'm very lucky. Yeah. <laughs> For free. For free. I think I think it shows through, especially uh, when Mila's in the trenches. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she, that was a lot of a lot of combat stuff to do, and uh, he helped with that. And then Mila herself was really quite honest about yeah. what the experience was like. So you know, it's oh, like with all that. Yeah, there's oh, that yeah. too. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, everybody is writing in the comments, Gladiator, that your thank you for your service, thank you for everything. So yeah. they're so happy to have met you. That is yeah. so cool. No, I'm quite welcome. Go Navy. Okay, Kate, you um intimated uh, in the green room that you had a good writing tip. So we're just going to add that on, even though we're running a little late, because I'm dying to know your writing tip. Well, I did have a good writing tip, but Emily Giffen and Harlan Coben totally scooped <laughs> me. Oh. <laughs> exactly what I typically say to people, which is, you know, embrace the suck, embrace the fact mm -hmm. that your first draft is going to be terrible. Just get it out there because you can, as Nora Roberts says, you can fix a bad page, but you can't fix a blank page. Yep. Um, so these are things I always tell new writers. But the other thing I would say, so in case you have already heard that, since you've, of course, sat in on Emily and Harlan's part of the show, find your tribe. You have yeah, to yeah. find your tribe because this is yes. a weird and solitary mm -hmm. profession. And it is really wonderful to have those people who are just like you in the sense that uh, you, know, you may not share any other demographic between you. Like I have had 
writer friends who are part of my tribe where we share nothing else. Like we're not in the yeah. same generation. We're not in the same, you know, the same part of the country. We've had vastly different backgrounds, but yeah. we all know what it's like to geek out over ancient maps. We yeah. all know what it's like to be seething about that two star review that said your book was derivative and didn't spell derivative right. And <laughs> we all know what it was to, you know, to, you know that, that particularly sick feeling that you get in when you just sent your book in after first pass edits and you get racked at 3 a.m. by the conviction that there's a timeline in there in chapter error in chapter 12 that you didn't fix. Yeah. And you have to get up and go yeah. to the document and paw through. Oh, my stomach just rolled over. Out. Yeah, and yeah. Stomach <laughs> just rolled, right? So finding your tribe, that is important. Whether, you know, these people are published or not, whether they're ahead of the journey, uh, publishing journey or the writing journey, or whether they're a little bit behind you or not, that find your people because your yeah. people will keep you sane through yeah. this very, very weird uh journey however it run rolls for you oh such okay. good advice yep thank yeah. you so much for joining us you are always like just a shining joy to have wow. on and i'm so glad we got to meet your husband yeah congratulations on all your success and everyone oh, else out sure. there thank <laughs> you so much for being a part of friends in fiction and oh anytime i love you ladies i will always be back anytime you need a slot and um I won't do the thing that I did last time where I forgot to make the conversion <laughs> from Eastern to Western time. And I missed my slot. So, cause I'm still <laughs> myself about that I'm doing the shame spiral. No, no we are so not happy. At all. Not at all. It made me feel better about myself. Cause I do that. And I, well, I was like, and, I'm so glad. And, 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 and look, tonight. we had a show tonight. about, Emily and Harlan are such good friends, right? And then Kate finished us off with this wonderful tip about friendship. I think right. it That's it was perfect. meant to be. Perfect. It became like yeah. the friendship perfect. show and that meant to be. That should be a book title. Meant to be. It was, it was, it was meant to be. Yeah. See you guys next year, next week. Oh god. <laughs> next, week. <laughs> next week. Right here. Same time, same place. We have two big surprise guest hosts. So you'll have to show up to see who they are. And y'all have a fantastic week. Thank you, Kate. Thanks, Thanks Kate. Kate. Good to see you.